Disneyland, a landmark in American history, a place where millions of visitors come every year, a place that thrives to this day. But few know that Disneyland almost didn't happen. Were not for the work of many creative minds, this iconic destination might never have happened. Let's discover the history of Disneyland, going far before Walt Disney, revealing how Disneyland transformed our understanding of escapism and immersion. To understand how Disneyland came to be, we need to understand the different elements that influenced this landmark destination. We need to understand how theme parks were born. It seems as if theme parks or amusement parks have always existed in one way or another. Yet, we can trace how the popular theme parks came to be with the rise of public parks. One of these was the Vauxhall Gardens. By the 18th century, London was a crowded city. Many of its inhabitants looked for opportunities of escapism. Taking advantage of this trend, Vauxhall Gardens would come to be. Located on the other side of the Thames River, it required visitors to escape the modern world via boat. Once on the other bank of the river, visitors would be welcomed into a world of dreams. Vauxhall offered live music and detailed landscaping, providing a somewhat new and unique experience. As London was becoming more crowded and industrial, Vauxhall offered a sense of escapism to its patrons. Meanwhile, in the Russian Empire, a trend emerged that would forever change the landscape of amusement. Sliding down tall hills had been a tradition for generations. But what if this could be enhanced, transformed into something even more exciting? By creating artificial hills crafted from sturdy wooden structures, they were able to create a more thrilling experience. However, there was one major downside. These attractions required ice to run, so they were not functional during summertime. Well, the Russians would find a solution to that. By using wheel carts instead of sleighs, the Russians were able to create what many consider to be the first roller coaster. This ride was quite simple. It required its visitors to ascend a large structure. Once at the top, they would enter the carts. The carts would then coast downhill in an experience never before seen. As this idea became more popular, it would spread to France, in what became known as Montagne Russe, or Russian coasters. Fairs also played a role in the rise of theme parks. Fairs up to this time had been held for centuries and in different forms. However, with the advent of industrial technology, we would see the rise of industrial expositions that showcased new inventions and products to the world. In the late 18th century France, we would see the Exposition des Produits Industries Françaises. One of the most notable of these events was the great exposition of the works of industry of all nations, housed within the impressive Crystal Palace. It demonstrated to the world that the power of industrial technology was a force to be reckoned. For a while, these fans were usually held in a single massive building or pavilion. But as they grew larger, the program would be separated into different pavilions, often recreating the architecture of different countries such as the Exposition Universelle from 1878. However, perhaps the most significant exposition in relation to theme parks was the 1893 Rhodes Columbia Exposition. One of the most iconic features of this fair was the original Ferris wheel. Designed by George Washington Yale Ferris Jr., it stood at an impressive 264 feet. It was a marvel of engineering and provided breathtaking views of the fairgrounds and the polluted Chicago skyline. Another transformative element of the 1893 exposition was the Midway Plaisance, a lively promenade that featured a variety of entertainment options including games, food, stalls and performances. This concept of a Midway became a staple at future fairs and laid the groundwork for the design of many amusement parks to come. Throughout the existence of themed entertainment, we can spot five main influences on the genre. World's fairs or fairs, recreational parks, pop culture and of course, when something becomes successful, we have the copycats. These five elements would at times be connected with one another 
and at other times completely disconnected. One of the first parks to bring these elements together would be Tivoli Gardens, as Tivoli had different distinct areas with distinct themes. Some of these took influence from World's Fairs. Allowing you to explore exotic locales, Tivoli was also influenced by recreational parks, with a lot of attention being put on its landscaping. Tivoli Gardens offered a unique experience of escapism. It even featured a roller coaster that went through a decorated artificial mountain. As such, Tivoli Gardens is considered to be the very first theme park. Meanwhile, we would see the rise of pier and boardwalk parks. These would pop up near the coasts of popular beaches. Many amusement parks of Coney Island, like Luna Park, are a great example of this. These parks not only attracted visitors to this bustling coastal destination, but also provided thrilling experiences. With the rise in popularity, the concept of dark rides became, began to take shape, adding an exciting new dimension to amusement parks by providing proto-immersive themes. In the United Kingdom, we had Blackpool Pleasure Beach, which is surprisingly still operational. The United States would also see the rise of trolley parks, usually located at the end of cable car lines. These parks would provide the different transportation companies with additional stream of income. We would see many amusement parks taking the inspiration from the Chicago World's Fair, the so-called electric parks, which embraced the vibrant atmosphere of the fair. These parks incorporated stunning popcorn lights. However, it all came down with the Great Depression. The post-war era would bring a new age of theme parks. We would start to see that in Europe and the United States. For instance, the Netherlands would see the Efteling. The Efteling was a park that combined both elements of pop culture in traditional fairy tales and recreational parks. As all of this happened, a man named Walt Disney had a vision. He grew an empire out of animated motion pictures. Pinpointing the exact date the concept of Disneyland came to be can be hard. However, you can see many ideas for what became Disneyland in the original Mickey Mouse Park. Walt Disney first thought of building his park on a strip of land across Riverside Drive from the Disney Studio in Burbank. The design of the park highlighted different aspects of American history. The train was an instrumental part in the original concepts for Walt's park. This was likely due to his connection with the railways at a young age. The park would also feature a sprawling river that worked like a moat. It would also accommodate steam ships. In the middle of it all would be a traditional American town. The layout of the park worked like a medieval fortress. The train would work as a burn, protecting the park from the outside world, and the river would work like a moat. Landscaping and recreation would also play a part at the original concept, highlighting the link between what would be Disneyland and recreational parks. Mickey Mouse Park would never happen. However, Walt's ambition grew larger. Imagine walking into a happy place, a place where you leave this world and enter one of fantasy, adventure and discovery, a place dedicated to the dreams and the hard facts that created America, a place that hoped to create joy for all those that enter its gates. To all who come to this happy place, welcome. Disneyland is your land. When we take a look at the general layout of Disneyland, we see that it is the realization of the ideal Renaissance city. With a hub in the middle, the park followed a somewhat symmetrical layout. Each path took you into a different land. Back in 1955, each land was isolated. To go between lands, you would need to return to the hub. One side featured a massive sprawling river, the Rivers of America, playing homage to America's past. We see here both elements of nostalgia and pop culture. Adventureland would be a romanticized vision of the exotic lands. At the time when decolonization was unfolding, Adventureland would bring guests back in time to when Europeans started exploring other lands afar. Main Street is theoretically similar to electric parks, yet it pays homage to a type of development that almost became extinct in America by the time Disneyland opened. Main Street stood as a reminder of great American cities that were now dying. 
with many influences from different World's Fairs, specifically the New York World's Fair. From 1939, Tomorrowland represented a spirit of optimism that was very much alive back then. The corner of the park would balance out the rivers of America over the years. This part would be the one to change the most, with the opening of the Matterhorn, the submarine voyage and the monorail. Tomorrowland needed to be constantly reimagined, a problem we still see to this day. Between Tomorrowland and Fantasyland stood a vacuum that would not be filled until 1959. Originally this space could have been a Lilliputian land. Well, this idea became the storybook circus, but now as part of Fantasyland. Anchored by the Sleeping Beauty Castle, Fantasyland would be home to the different fairy tales Disney adapted into animated films. Disneyland was the embodiment of the American way of life. It represented the vision of what America was and what it should be. Another factor that would play into the success of Disneyland was the very people that worked in its development. Many architects, artists and animators came over to help build and design this park. Here we see a crucial element. Many of these people came from the art of theater and set design. Perhaps Disneyland is the best show ever played on a walking stage. A number of factors played into the rise of Disneyland. First was the economic boom of the post-war era, raising the standard of living for many families and allowing them to dispose their money at pleasure parks. The rise of Walt Disney Studios gave Disney the advertisement it needed. Walt Disney could televised to the entire nation the concept of Disneyland. But most importantly, Disneyland was unlike any other place on planet Earth. A fair, an amusement park, an exhibition, a city from Arabian Nights, a metropolis from the future, Disneyland had it all. As Disneyland would continue to expand adding new attractions and even new lands, we find ourselves seeing the deep connection between theme parks and world's fairs as Walt Disney would help create several pavilions for the 1964 World's Fair. This included a show celebrating Abraham Lincoln's legacy, a rotating theater to showcase man's progress through electrical appliances, a prehistorical journey sponsored by Ford, and last but not least, a boat flume ride that brought a message of world peace. But Disneyland would not be alone in this World's Fair. Aero developments would showcase their design for a log flume ride. Once again, we see the deep connection between the two genres. After the World's Fair ended, Walt Disney would continue expanding Disneyland, adding the New Orleans Square, which was a massive immersive land. But Walt Disney was an ambitious man. Was an ambitious man. He built a studio, he built a company, and now he had built a massive theme park. But he had bigger plans.